It is my pleasure to present Dr. Robert Person, who is coming to us this morning from West Point. He is the Professor of International Relations and Comparative Politics, and he is going to deliver his insights into the historical origins of the Ukraine crisis. The mission of the East-West Institute is to reduce and prevent international conflict by facilitating dialogues that bridge divides and address seemingly intractable problems. Uh, and I think we'd probably all agree that Ukraine is one of these. In that spirit, our speaker series is intended to help our donors, friends, and network around the world gain insights and deeper understanding beyond the headlines into today's issues and conflicts as well as to present new thinking and stimulate constructive dialogue. Dr. Person will help us learn more about the very deep historical legacies of nationalism and cultural divide in Ukraine. And I think the implication is that the future is likely to be divided as well. Dr. Person's research and teaching interests include post-Soviet politics, democratization, authoritarianism, nationalism, mass political participation, and public opinion in non-democratic states. He earned his PhD in political science from Yale. He also holds a master's degree in Russian, East European and Eurasian studies from Stanford, and a BA in international relations and Slavic languages and literature from Stanford. Dr. Person is going to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we will open up the floor for questions. We are videotaping this program, and it will be posted to the East-West Institute website. Thank you, Dr. Person. All righty. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that very kind uh, introduction. And thank you uh, so much to the Institute for the inv invitation to speak here today. Um, it really is an honor. Uh, I've got tremendous respect for the work uh, that the Institute has done uh, in its history and continues to do. And as Sarah noted, uh, I think now more than ever, uh, that work of developing uh, understanding um, and looking for alternative ways to encourage cooperation uh, between significant players in the international system is, uh, though perhaps more challenging uh, than uh, in recent memory, is all the more important. Um, so I'm uh, extraordinarily pleased to be uh, a part of that by being here with you today. Um, before uh, I jump into the content of my talk, um, I, I should just point out uh, to, to appease the good folks that pay my salary uh, that the views expressed in this presentation are those of uh, my own and do not reflect the official policy of the Department of the Army. DOD or the US government. Okay, so that said, um, what I'd like to do today is, is dig in uh, deep uh, to uh, some of Ukraine's history, uh, its history uh, of uh, sort of territorial development and the ways in which that has affected uh, Ukraine's cultural landscape uh, because it's a very complicated history, a complicated uh, historical legacy and, and one that really does pose some significant challenges for Ukraine going into the future. So I'll be begin with uh, with this map, uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, this map or some variant of it. Uh, this map shows the electoral results of the presidential election in Ukraine in 2010. That was the matchup between uh, Yanukovych and Timoshenko. Uh, and, and this map sort of exemplifies what many people have uh, noted are uh, these cultural divisions uh, between Eastern Ukraine and Western Ukraine. In fact, I could have chosen almost almost any electoral map from Ukraine's post-Soviet history, and you would have seen roughly the same division, just different names uh, running on the ballot. Um, the case that I'll make to you today, however, is that Ukraine's cultural divide is actually far more complicated than this uh, map would suggest, and, and that, of course, is part of the problem. Throughout the course of my presentation, uh, as, as we are racing through Ukraine's history, I'd like you to keep your eye on the three stars uh, that you see here. Those three stars are representing sort of emblematic cities of Ukraine um, throughout its history. Of course, in the center, uh, that gold star uh, represents Kiev, uh, the capital of contemporary Ukraine. Uh, in the west, uh, that star represents the city of Lviv. Uh, in western Ukraine, uh, often sort of rightly considered the cradle of Ukrainian nationalism. Uh, and in the east, uh, of course, 
uh, the city of Donetsk, uh, which has been uh, the source of some of the most severe fighting in the recent uh, in the recent conflict. So. Ukraine's cultural uh, tapestry uh, is, as I said, the product of a very long history of territorial expansion by the Russian and Soviet empires into you know, what we'll refer to as the Ukrainian lands. Uh, and that process and the timing of that process has very important implications for uh, the question of national identity in Ukraine. And in fact, we find wide variation across Ukraine uh, in the uh, degree to which uh, Russian and Russianness is perceived as foreign or alien or otherwise um, external to uh, to the Ukrainian identity. And that fact has uh, some important implications, certainly for how Ukraine relates to Russia politically, uh, but it also has some important implications for how Ukrainians understand their own political identity, their own national identity. Identity and uh, and in many respects, sort of the destiny of, of the Ukrainian nation. So our story, our, our historical story, uh, goes back nearly a thousand years. Don't worry, we'll cover history quickly. Uh, but it begins uh, in uh, around the 12th century, uh, the height of the polity that was known as Kievan Rus, uh, originally founded in the 19th uh, in the ninth century uh, with its capital uh, central located in the city of Kiev. Uh, Kiev, by virtue of this, uh, this sort of founding, um, founding moment in the polity of Kiev and Rus, Kiev is really seen as sort of the cradle of Russian civilization, the cradle of Eastern Slavic uh, civilization. Uh, and, and that owes largely to the fact that it was Prince Vladimir of Kiev who uh, accepted and adopted uh, Eastern Orthodoxy for his uh, population in 988 um, and uh, and so to this day Kiev holds tremendous symbolic importance for uh, for Russian uh, culture uh, I sort of equate it to perhaps the symbolism of Philadelphia uh, as sort of the cradle of, of where our sort of national principles were, were forged and uh, and so if you can imagine uh, a version of the world in which sort of Philadelphia uh, is no longer uh, within the territory of the United States you can perhaps start to grasp why, for Russia, Kiev is not just another city. It's not just another post-Soviet capital. Um, so we move forward in history. Uh, of course, all good things must come to an end, and uh, Kiev and Rus uh, goes into a period of decline starting in the 12th century and by 1240 Kiev falls to the uh, invasion from the east by the Mongols uh, and then sort of its its lands are sort of divided and dispersed mostly tributaries uh, to uh, to the Mongols uh, in its place uh, moving into the 15th century uh, the polity known as the Grand Duchy of Lithuania arises uh, that of course uh, eventually evolves into what became known as the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth down the line, but it's in the 6th, 16th century, uh, a little farther to the east, that the story begins to get interesting. It's at this time that the Principality of uh, Muscovy, Moscow, uh, begins to rise, begins to expand its territory under um, the Muscovite princes uh, and begins to sort of swallow up the smaller principalities around it such that by the era of Ivan III, Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible uh, as he's better known, uh, Russia begins expanding uh, back westward into what we now sort of would refer to as the Ukrainian lands. And so it's in this period by 1598 uh, that you can see Russian control or Muscovite control, if you will, uh, has been extended to the lands that are now part of eastern Ukraine. This, of course, means that the people living there, of course, back then didn't understand themselves as Ukrainians or Russians. This is before nationalism, before national identity really has uh, emerged as a phenomenon. Um, so these peasants uh, living in this area, the fact that they're ruled by Moscow hundreds of miles away really doesn't mean anything. Uh, anything to them uh, other than the fact it's important for us to remember that uh, the history of political uh, rule for Moscow over those lands does extend back uh, 
uh, for many centuries. Uh, moving forward in time, in 1654, the Treaty of Pereslav, and I won't bore you with all of the details behind what's going on there, uh, but the important point is that it's at that point uh, that uh, Russia, uh, now, um, uh, you know, now known uh, as more than just the Principality of Moscow, but Russia extends its control deeper into the Ukrainian lands, um, taking all of what's known as left bank Ukraine, uh, reference to the Dnieper River, which run, which flows to the south. So if you picture the left bank is uh, is to the east of the Dnieper. So Russian control extends uh, to the Dnieper and also includes Kiev. 1654, that Kiev comes under Moscow's political control. So again, that large swath of eastern and now central Ukraine uh, has a very long history of being part of a Russian polity. Uh, and I would argue that that does have some important uh, implications for how the populations living there, even to this day, view the idea, the legitimacy of uh, relationships uh, with Russia. We move forward in time. The next big set of events to take place in the Ukrainian lands comes at the end of the 18th century with the partitions of Poland. Uh, this is uh, the moment at which uh, Poland sort of realizes its very unfortunate geography of being a flat country caught between great powers um, and between the great powers, namely Prussia, Russia, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Poland is divided and dismembered such that by the end of the 18th century, it's been wiped off the map. And in that process, which took place under Catherine the Great, uh, we see in the areas that are tan and red in the map uh, that Russian control of the Ukrainian lands has now extended even further westward uh, to include most of central Ukraine. Uh, important to note what doesn't get, uh, what doesn't get uh, captured by the Russians during this period is that western city of Lviv, western Ukraine, the region that's referred to as Galicia, uh, that goes to the Habsburgs. It goes to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, a fact which has tremendous implications uh, down the line. Um, because the Habsburgs, uh, despite many of their shortcomings, uh, did seem to understand something important about identity. They understood something that future scholars of nationalism would come to understand. The Habsburgs actually allowed and encouraged the rise of Ukrainian nationalist movements uh, in that region of Galicia. Um, and they did so because they saw it as a strategy of establishing a buffer or a bulwark against future Russian expansion into that region. Of course, they knew that ethnically uh, their Ukrainians were very similar to the ethnic Ukrainians living just on the other side of the border in the Russian Empire, and so they actually allowed this sort of strong and independent nationalist movement to rise, um, such that if the Russians ever attempted to take those lands, uh, they might perhaps be rejected by the Ukrainian nationalists. Um, what subsequent scholars of nationalism have found and have argued, um, and, and this perhaps was not known to the Habsburgs, uh, is that it, as it turns out, once you teach a population to be national, once you turn peasants into, fresh, uh, in, into Frenchmen, not into freshmen, once you turn peasants into Frenchmen, uh, and, uh, and Ukrainians and, and Poles and whatnot, um, it becomes extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, to renationalize those populations to something else. Um, you, uh, once you have Frenchmen, you will never convince them that they are, in fact, German. Uh, once you have uh, Ukrainians with strong national identities, you will never convince those populations that they are anything but. Um, and so that will have some important implications down the road, uh, as we'll see. Thank you.
when history moves on. Uh, other important piece of territorial acquisition by the Russian Empire under Catherine the Great, 1783, uh, they acquire Crimea and uh, southern Ukraine from the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this region gets labeled Novorossiya, New Russia. Uh, we've heard that term pop up again in the recent conflict, sort of reviving this idea. Uh, but in this period, uh, there was a large influx of ethnic Russians uh, from the Russian Empire proper, um, significant colonization, and that accounts uh, in large parts for the large ethnic Russian uh, population that remains in those regions today. So we can fast forward quite a bit now uh, and actually move up to the interwar period uh, to look at how things stood. Of course, now we have the Soviet Union, and I realize that I've glossed over a lot of history there. Uh, but we've got the Soviet Union, and we've got the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. And you can see that, for the most part, uh, the, uh, the empire's borders are where they stood, sort of at the height of the Russian, empi uh, Russian Empire. Uh, and again, very important that the boundaries of Ukraine, the political boundaries, uh, are cut off um, right at that region uh, known as Galicia. And Lviv uh, and uh, Galicia at this time are uh, under the control, they're part of interwar Poland. This, of course, comes to an unfortunate end in 1940 with the Soviet annexations that were part of the secret protocol of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, this is, of course, where Hitler and Stalin divide Eastern Europe. They divide Poland. Uh, the Soviets are sort of granted uh, permission to take the Baltics. Uh, and so they move into these territories. And so it's in 1940. 1940, that the city of Lviv, that Western Ukraine, that Galicia, for the first time in its history, comes under Russian or Soviet rule. Uh, and uh, and so what happens here uh, is, again, you've had now over a century of strong Ukrainian nationalist movements uh, operating on that territory, defining and shaping what it means to be Ukrainian uh, culturally, um, such that when the Soviet army rolls in, uh, it is seen as an illegitimate foreign occupier. And in fact, during World War II, the Ukrainian nationalist movements are fighting against the Soviets uh, and also fighting against the Germans uh, at the same time. Um, and in some cases, uh, at least early on, did collaborate with uh, the German military in fighting the Soviets. Uh, they quickly realized that, um, that uh, German rule would be no better than Soviet rule uh, and then continued to resist all forms of occupation. That Resistance as evidence of sort of how strong that perception of sort of the illegitimacy of Soviet rule was in this reg region. That resistance continued um, largely underground, but continued nonetheless into the 1950s, the mid 1950s. It outlasted Stalin, even, who died in 1953. And even after the resistance was snuffed out and the last of its leaders were captured and executed, that perception, that sort of underground resistance, perhaps kitchen table resistance, uh, conversations that, that go on at home uh, or uh, among close friends, that of course continued throughout the rest of the Soviet period as Moscow's rule was seen as a foreign imposition. So to fast forward then, uh, oh, going backwards, uh, to Ukraine's modern borders. Of course, there's an important uh, change to note that takes place in 1954. Uh, this is when the Crimean Peninsula is actually transferred from the Russian Soviet Republic to the Ukrainian Republic. Uh, this is Khrushchev's gift uh, to Ukraine in gratitude for their efforts in the war. Um, it's really just an, an administration 
administrative uh, transfer at the time when you're all part of the Soviet Union. It doesn't really matter which republic uh, is in charge of Ukraine. But of course in 1991, when you break up the Soviet Empire, you break it up into its 15 constituent republics. Now Crimea is part of uh, the independent country of Ukraine, which raises all sorts of issues, obviously with the Russian Black Sea Fleet based in Sevastopol. Um, that creates some problems uh, that, uh, that unfortunately I don't have time to get into, uh, but happy to discuss in the Q&A. Um, the consequence of that long historical process that I've just described for you uh, means that there's significant variation across Ukraine's territory in how Ukrainians relate culturally to Russia, to Russians, to Russian culture, and, uh, and whatnot. Some in the western parts of Ukraine, in the city of Lviv, Russian, uh, see Russia as a foreign occupier um, and uh, an oppressive force uh, that, uh, that wreaked havoc on their lands during the period of Soviet rule and importantly detached them from their European destiny. Remember they spent uh, well over a hundred years as part of the Habsburg em uh, Empire and, and culture Culturally, uh, perhaps were much more oriented towards sort of Viennese European culture, uh, and in many respects see their destiny, their true cultural destiny, with uh, with uh, Europe rather than eastward with Russia. On the other hand, the farther east you go, those portions of Ukraine that were under Moscow's control under Russian rule for centuries, even before there was a Ukrainian nation or even a Russian nationality, uh, to them uh, they see uh, Russia as, uh, as sort of a brother, a close cousin bound, uh, bound by blood, very similar languages, cultural traditions. Again, they both trace their origins back to, uh, to Kiev and Rus. And of course that difference, uh, which isn't just a difference noted by Russians in Ukraine versus Ukrainians in Ukraine, that difference actually cuts across linguistic lines as we'll see because in many respects that understanding of what it means to be Ukrainian. What does it mean to be a member of the Ukrainian nation? There's significant difference even across uh, ethnic Ukrainians on that question and it comes down uh, in many respects to you know who educated you? Were you educated? Was your population educated and nationalized in the West uh, through nationalist curricula um, in that Western portion of Ukraine? Or was that population made literate um, under the Soviet education system, in which case the Soviet version of Ukrainian was this sort of narrative of Ukraine as the younger Slavic brother of the great Russian nation, the friendship, uh, the friendship of nations, and so on and so forth. And so that different understanding of what it means to be Ukrainian, uh, especially in relation to the Russian idea, uh, displays uh, tremendous variation across Ukraine's territory. Uh, and we can see that variation in the historical legacy of Russian rule when we look at some modern maps uh, showing some demographic data from, uh, from Ukraine. Uh, so this map shows uh, the ethnic composition of Ukraine. Uh, the darker areas are areas where there's higher percentages of ethnic Ukrainians. Uh, and in fact, you can see, perhaps surprisingly, at least given the popular impression I think that we get in the media, is that the vast majority of Ukraine is populated by ethnic Ukrainians. In fact, it was only Crimea that had a majority ethnic Russian population. Now granted, the Russian populations are much larger uh, in, in the east than in the west, but even in those eastern provinces that are the scene of the fighting today, Today, uh, there are majority ethnic Ukrainian populations. But things get a little more complicated when we overlay a map showing the linguistic realities in Ukraine. The yellow portions in the map are the portions that, rep, uh, that report Ukrainian as their primary language, uh, and the areas in blue fading into darker blue are the areas where 
uh, Russian is their primary language. So you piece those two maps together, and I apologize for not having done that. My Photoshop skills aren't quite that good. But you piece those three maps together, um, and you actually sort of see that there are three distinct groups to be concerned about. There's, of course, the ethnic Ukrainians in the West who speak Ukraine as their prime, Ukrainian as their primary language. There's the Russian-speaking ethnic Russians in the East, but there's this huge swath of the population that are ethnic Ukrainians, but that use Russian as their primary language. And certainly as the crisis was unfolding, uh, there was a lot of question as to where that center group's loyalties would fall. Would they orient themselves more along sort of national lines uh, towards the Ukrainian idea, or did they see their loyalties Loyalties sort of more closely tied and aligned with uh, with their language, uh, with their Russian language. I think we've seen quite a few signs in the last few months that suggest that most of those Ukrainians want uh, an independent, strong Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and I think that's certainly important uh, from the perspective of, uh, of how Kiev uh, handles, uh, handles its complex sort of divisions. Uh, as if that weren't complicated enough, I never said this was going to be easy. Uh, if we drill down to the regional level, uh, this uh, is a map of Kharkiv Oblast. Uh, interestingly, hasn't been uh, one of the eastern oblasts characterized by the most severe fighting. Uh, there are concerns, though, if the conflict really does flare up in a bad way again, Kharkiv could be sort of the next, uh, the next to go, and and could resemble uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. But uh, but what we see in Kharkiv is characteristic of uh, those other provinces, the eastern provinces that have been the source of fighting, and that. That is that those ethnic Russian populations that we sort of, you know, if, if we accept this narrative that eastern Ukraine uh, is sort of all Russian, uh, you know, populated by, by Russians, in fact, this map shows that the ethnic Russians are tightly, tightly concentrated in the cities. And that's certainly a consequence of uh, a lot of factors, including the Soviet era, where, uh, where uh, Russians were coming in um, and largely working in industrial uh, sectors of the economy. Uh, and the surrounding countryside, uh, even in these eastern provinces, are heavily, uh, heavily Ukrainian. So I think that uh, this sort of lays to rest uh, any notion uh, that, that we hear from time to time, any notion that Ukraine could somehow be partitioned, uh, that it could be cleaved. Uh, Ukraine cannot be cleaved cleanly because there are no clear dividing lines. Even if you were to, you know, whether you draw that line at, uh, according to that first electoral map I showed, or if you even just tried to lop off uh, three eastern provinces, any way you cut Ukraine, you would end up with significant Ukrainian populations uh, moving uh, into, uh, into the Russian polity if they, were to, uh, if they were to be annexed. And of course, that would open up a whole new can of worms. So speaking of those electoral results, this complicated tapestry is further highlighted when we move from those district or, or oblast level um, electoral outcomes and, uh, and look at a finer grained uh, level of vote totals in that 2010 election. And we see that it's not so much that there is a clear stark line between Timoshenko territory and Yanukovych territory, but in fact there's sort of a bleeding gradient such that there were Timoshenko supporters in eastern Ukraine and likewise when we flip it around yes uh, eastern Ukraine was uh, was the uh, the strong base of support for Yanukovych uh, but that support did bleed westward um, so again whether by force or voluntarily uh, Ukraine can't easily be divided without running that divide across some uh, pretty important cultural fault lines. Uh, given that tremendously complicated legacy uh, of politics and identity and geopolitics,
geography, uh, it's, it's reasonable to ask, uh, what will it take for Ukraine to survive? What will it take for Ukraine to survive uh, within its sovereign borders? What will it take for the government in Kiev to survive its current challenges. Um, I'll start by talking about some of the external challenges that, uh, that uh, the new government in Kiev faces. I, I won't dwell on these too much, um, but if, if we want to get into uh, more the, the external environment in q and I'm, I'm happy to do so. Uh, obviously, the biggest external challenge uh, that, uh, that Kiev faces uh, is coming from Russia uh, and Russia's involvement in uh in the conflict uh, and the separatist movements in eastern Ukraine. Um, I, I think that, uh, that Putin, uh, that Russia is playing the long game here. Um, I don't believe that they've got serious designs on annexing uh, the Donbass, uh, eastern Ukraine. Uh, I think if he had wanted to do so, he would have done so already because he certainly had the capability um, given the military aspect assets that Russia has, given the fact there was nothing that the Ukrainian military could have done to stop it. If they had wanted to take it, they could have, uh, and they haven't. Um, so what is he after? Uh, I think he's waiting for the government in Kiev to collapse, um, largely of its own, uh, its own accord. Um, but certainly willing to uh, assist uh, the, uh, the, that outcome. Uh, and so I think what we'll continue to see is sort of Putin keeping his finger on the scale, if you will, uh, applying uh, pressure where he can um, and trying to undermine the stability. Of, uh, of the Ukrainian government. And in the meantime, uh, what he's ended up with is a classic frozen conflict. Uh, and I think that's what we'll see going forward uh, in, those, uh, in those territories around Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, and in many respects, a frozen conflict actually suits Putin's interests uh, quite well, I think. Uh, in many, it, it essentially gives him uh, more or less a veto over future Ukrainian membership in NATO or the European Union because it's hard to imagine either of those organizations accepting Ukraine as a member with these outstanding territorial, uh, territorial disputes. Um, so I think that's uh, certainly uh, an issue that, that Kiev will have to deal with uh, going forward. The other external challenge, though, that Kiev faces, I would argue, comes from the West. Uh, I think we have to be sort of clear-eyed realists here and appreciate that Russia will never accept Ukraine and NATO, um, or certainly not any version of a Russian polity that we can imagine today. Um, and so if that's true, uh, I do think it's worth asking whether, uh, whether NATO, whether the West, whether the EU should continue to offer, out that, offer up that possibility, even rhetorically, to Ukraine. Um, should we uh, encourage their hopes uh, to the degree that sort of that hope may fuel more provocative policies that are likely to, uh, to bring greater Russian um, aggression on uh, on Ukraine. Remember that, of course, it was the issue of Ukraine's uh, agreement, uh, association agreement with the EU that sparked the protests in the first place, that sparked this divide, and sparked the very harsh reaction from Moscow against it. I think uh, to the degree that Ukraine continues to grasp, uh, you know, grasp westward, I think we can expect to see continuing Russian efforts to prevent that from happening. So uh, one must ask whether perhaps um, a more realistic policy, if we want to maintain the territorial integrity of Ukraine, is to think about uh, encouraging a more neutral Ukraine uh, that, uh, again, due to its unfortunate position in the world, uh, really can't afford to turn too decisively towards west or east. Um, on the domestic front, the domestic challenges, uh, I actually think that uh, the most severe 
threats to the existence of a unified, independent, sovereign Ukraine are the domestic threats uh, that it's facing right now. If Kiev hopes to survive, uh, it has to be able to govern from the center. And of course, there are two implied tasks in that statement. It has to be able to govern, and it has to do so from the center. Uh, so let's talk about governance. Um, on some level, the government has to be able to fulfill the basic functions of the state. And its inability to do so, uh, I do think, represent the most severe, uh, most severe threat to, uh, to the Kiev government's future. Uh, going back to our, uh, our Weberian roots, of course, we recall that uh, you know the definition of the state is the organization that can maintain a monopoly of force over its territory. Uh, we can all agree that uh, that Ukraine currently uh, cannot claim that monopoly of force, um, and so that certainly causes problem for uh, for the stateness of uh, of Ukraine. Uh, but there's other obviously very urgent uh, problems on the horizon, or or not even on the horizon. They're here right now. Uh, Ukraine's economy is in a tailspin. Uh, if it hopes to uh, to sort of reform the system, uh, this will surely involve uh, austerity measures, probably even more significant economic uh, contraction. And we all know uh, that such uh, severe economic conditions, sooner or later, um, there's a good chance that that could provoke some form of mass protest. Against uh, against the new government, if it simply can't make the situation any better, and so it's not hard to imagine in the next couple of years, I think, uh, sort of a similar protest movement arising uh, against uh, the Poroshenko government, um, and uh, and that cr certainly could cause some serious problems for them. Uh, and then, of course, you have this enormous problem uh, in Ukraine's uh, political and economic system, the problem of uh, very deep and severe corruption um, and simply just bad governance. Uh, and, and this ultimately becomes a question of legitimacy. Uh, if the government is not able to meet the basic needs of its population, if it is not able to perform uh, then sooner or later, uh, Ukrainians of uh, of any stripe are really going to start to question whether uh, whether this government is a legitimate one, whether it legitimately represents uh, their needs and their interests. Uh, so governance, big question mark, huge challenges, um, and no guarantee that uh, that Ukraine or the government in Kiev are well equipped to uh, to solve those problems. The second implied task of course, the second big challenge domestically, as I said, is governing from the center. And here I mean sort of culturally from the center um, because uh, administrative decentralization may be part of the solution. Uh, but governing from the center, again, thinking about this, uh, this very complex tapestry, uh, this mixed legacy uh, of national identity, of relations with Russia, with orientation, towards those different entities uh, is going to require someone to walk a very fine line down the middle. So first thing that the government in Kiev needs to do is find a way to restrain the nationalists, uh, the nationalist forces from western Ukraine. Uh, those nationalist groups really were the driving force behind the Maidan protests um, and were a, a driving force in forcing Yanukovych out of power back in February, uh, they were overrepresented in the provisional government uh, in positions, and that certainly showed in some of the, uh, the policies uh, that that government pursued. Uh, fortunately, um, I, they did not do particularly well, uh, or at least the far-right nationalist groups didn't do particularly well in the parliamentary elections that were just held at the end of October. Um, but do remember uh, that they were the leaders of my done, and they have demonstrated uh, a pretty impressive mobilizational capacity such that uh, if they turn on, uh, on the new government, um, that certainly could threaten 
the stability. So on the one hand, keeping them satisfied but not giving them too much influence is going to be uh, a challenge for Kiev because, of course, the other tremendous problem that they have uh, is this one of healing the divisions uh, that have really been ripped open uh, open wide, uh, particularly in eastern Ukraine. Uh, you have to keep uh, those Russian speakers and the ethnic Russians uh, invested in the idea of a sovereign Ukraine uh, living within its, uh, its current borders. Because again, uh, drawing on a classic definition of uh, legitimacy from the late uh, political scientist um, Seymour Martin Lipset, uh, legitimacy as the ability of uh, a government to engender the belief among the population that its institutions are the most appropriate ones for society. Convincing your population that these are the right institutions the correct institutions to govern the society. Um, that's sort of the trick to generating legitimacy. If Ukraine's Russian-speaking population, and if its ethnic Russian population, do not believe that its interests are being guaranteed or met by the government in Kiev, they'll simply not see it as legitimate. Um, and in this respect, unfortunately, the government in Kiev made some critical mistakes, I think, in, uh, in the early days. Uh, right after Yanukovych fled, uh, the parliament passed a language law or a revision of the current language law on the books. It established Ukrainian as the sole official state language. Of course, prior to that, Ukrainian and Russian had been official state languages. And in fact, it was that passage of language bill that touched off the protest movements in eastern Ukraine. That's what started bringing people into the streets. And of course, we know how that has snowballed to this, uh, to this day. They quickly realized the mistake and repealed that law, but not after the damage had been done. Um, Many people sort of held out hope that perhaps uh, the new parliamentary elections, which were just held in October, could perhaps begin to heal some of these divisions as well, pinning their hopes on that. Uh, and unfortunately, I think this next map suggests that those hopes uh, will go unmet. This map shows turnout uh, in the parliamentary elections uh, of uh, a week or two ago. Uh, the, uh, the sort of darker greens are areas of higher turnout uh, and the areas of darker red are the areas where there was much lower turnout. So irrespective of parties and vote totals and whatnot, here we can see, of course, some very important realities. First, of course, there was no voting uh, in the areas controlled by the rebels, no big surprise. But also, there was very, very low turnout in the parts of eastern Ukraine that do still have those Russian-speaking uh, and ethnic Russian minorities. And so I think there's a case to be made here that you know they were not turning out uh, because there is some question as to sort of the, the legitimacy and, and the degree to which uh, the government in Kiev uh, you know, will represent their interests. And so not surprisingly, given what we now know about sort of the cultural map of Ukraine in combination with, uh, with sort of the map of turnout, um, not surprisingly, the elections produced a strongly pro-Western um, and uh, an anti-Russian parliament. Um, which is certainly within you know the full sovereign rights of the Ukrainian people to vote as they wish, um, and and I certainly would not deny that. Uh, but let's understand that that's a double-edged sword. Um, it's a double-edged sword because, of course, you still have this problem if that is the government that's governing in the country, um, and yet it doesn't represent. It I literally does not have uh, members of parliament that necessarily represent the interests of those minority populations. Uh, what does that mean for those populations' perception of the legitimacy of the system? And then, of course, we have to be concerned, going back to the external problem, will this government be more likely to pursue policies that, uh, while fully within their sovereign rights, uh, are more likely to exacerbate or otherwise provoke a stronger Russian reaction? Um, and so that's something that, uh, that certainly is an area of concern. Uh, 
Talking in institutional terms, uh, the last thing that I'll address before uh, before we open to, to questions uh, is uh, the sort of last straw that that perhaps could save the whole project. Um, Albeit with uh, with significant challenges, this is the idea of some sort of decentralization uh, or some sort of federalized solution that would devolve significant authorities or autonomy to the regions, such that especially those eastern regions uh, would feel more comfortable, more at home, uh, being part of the Ukrainian state. Uh, it's important, though, to ask uh, what kind of federal solution are we talking about? Uh, if we're talking sort of cultural or linguistic autonomy, uh, that's one thing. It could help. Can't promise that it would solve the problems or be enough to solve these enormous problems, but it would start moving in that direction, I think. On the other hand, uh, of course, one of the solutions that has been pushed uh, directly from Moscow is sort of their ideal political solution at times is a much more significant fiscal uh, decentralization uh, or federalization and, and even foreign policy decentralization such that those eastern regions uh, in terms of their foreign policy would be granted the authority to uh, determine a much more independent course which we assume would orient more towards Moscow's interests and on the fiscal uh, fiscal side of things you know the argument has been made that uh, that uh, revenue generated within uh, within the oblast uh, should stay in the oblast, uh, and it, you know it may be a nice uh, nice idea in principle, but of course uh, you know Vladimir Putin uh, is uh, is no dummy, uh, and I think he understands as uh, as many would that of course that uh, that type of solution would be incredibly problematic for the government in Kiev. Remember, of course, that the Donbas is the industrialized uh, sort of heartland of Ukraine the center of Ukrainian industry, particularly coal and steel. And so any sort of fiscal federal solution that would cut off that revenue from Kiev um, would obviously uh, undermine its ability to fulfill those basic governance tasks. Uh, so yeah, I, I hate ending this on a, on a pessimistic note, uh, but I think the reality is uh, that the challenges are immense. Uh, the odds uh, are against uh, Ukraine uh, and Kiev, I think, um, and so uh, unfortunately, uh, I would predict that uh, that we're still in for uh, for a bumpy ride. Uh, so I will conclude my prepared remarks uh, with that. Happy to take any questions uh, from uh, from the room uh, or from any of the callers, um, and I look forward to that.